Greetings from Louisville, Kentucky, and welcome to this joyous Easter worship celebration. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and to be glad in it. Wherever you are or whatever you are doing, in the midst of all of this, we are reminded that after darkness shall come dawn, after striving will come peace, not by our power, but by the power of the risen Lord. We rejoice that we're able to worship with all of you Presbyterian Church USA members around the denomination, and it is an honor for us to share this worship service with you. Let's bow our heads as we begin to worship God. Gracious God, we thank you that in the midst of the horror and in the midst of the sometimes tumultuous life, you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. You have shown us, O oh God, that you are the almighty God, that in the midst of all that we are going through, you share with us your light, and you don't waste a hurt. Good Friday does become Easter Sunday. Lord, we thank you that dawn will become the reality for us as light shines and your presence and power continues to clothe and comfort us. We thank you for this service of worship and for your church and for your people, not only within our denomination, but all over the world. May the joy of Easter, the hope of the risen Lord, the knowledge that we will go through to get to the other side of everything that we are experiencing, may that knowledge compel us and drive us and inspire us to keep moving in these challenging times. May this worship service bless your people. May it inspire us all to be like you. You suffered and yet you endured and you showed us that there is hope. And so we thank you. We bless you for all the ways in which you are working in the world. And we ask for your healing presence and power on this worship service today. In Christ's name, amen. nuestros pecados. Si decimos que no tenemos pecado, nos engañamos a nosotras y a nosotros mismos, y la verdad no está en nosotros. Si confesamos nuestros pecados, Dios es justo para perdonarnos y limpiarnos de toda maldad. Con confianza en la misericordia de Dios, confesemos nuestros pecados. Por tu amor, oh Dios, ten compasión de nosotros y de nosotras. Por tu gran ternura, borra nuestras culpas. En tu inmenso amor y misericordia, perdónanos, oh Dios. Reconocemos que hemos sido rebeldes. 
Nuestro pecado no se borra de nuestra mente. En tu inmenso amor y misericordia, perdónanos, oh Dios. Contra ti hemos pecado y solo contra ti, haciendo lo malo lo que tú condenas. En tu inmenso amor y misericordia, perdónanos, oh Dios. Oh Dios, Pon en nosotros un corazón limpio. Danos un espíritu nuevo y fiel. Por Jesucristo nuestro Señor. Amén. Cualquiera que está en Cristo, nueva criatura es. El pasado ha quedado atrás. Todo vuelve a ser puro y nuevo. Amigas, amigos, crean en las buenas nuevas del Evangelio. En Cristo. Hemos recibido el perdón de nuestros pecados. Amén. Our gospel reading on this Easter day is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, the story of the journey to Emmaus. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight they said to each other were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us that same hour they got up and returned to jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. La palabra de Dios. Thanks be to God. It's 
It is a sad day for the followers of Jesus Christ, for they are retreating in fear and shock after the crucifixion of their friend, their spiritual leader, their advocate, and now their martyr. All for the cause of standing for righteousness and truth. For in the middle of all of this story is the continued struggle of Jesus with the Roman government. Coming face to face with this execution in this moment brings us to a point of knowing that any time we engage in those things that are oppositional to power and also to structural damage to the life of communities and faith, we need to be prepared to face what Jesus did, a cross. Maybe not in the same way, but certainly to know that there will be opposition even to righteousness. And so he faced this execution while being nailed to the cross for healing the sick and giving sight to the blind, for encouraging the poor, for standing in the midst of others, which was somehow or another communicated as being subversive activity. And yes, we stand here in this period of time, not simply where there are persons who are poor and struggling, but we as a nation are now being crippled by a coronavirus. We know it with so many implications and has implications for our lives. This coronavirus is causing us to stop and delay for a moment to think through what our lives will be as we sit at home, trying to stay away from the possibility of sickness or death. It reminds us of the vulnerability that we face each and every day when we are finding ourselves confined, unable to go to our jobs, unable to carry out our lives as we would like to. The coronavirus right now reminds us of the realities of life and death and the potential for what it means in some sense to make the best of the time we have while we have time. This is not a prophecy of death. It is simply a rule of life that we are here for a purpose. We are here to understand a deeper part of who we are is connected to a God who expects something of us. And so, as we think about this day of resurrection, this great calling to celebrate the life, death, burial of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, to give thanks to God for resurrection, which we too are promised to be raised with Christ if we carry out the will of God on this side of heaven, and if we speak faithfully and truthfully to what God calls us to and lives a life that is worthy of God's affection and God's approval. There is a reward, for that is what faith tells us. And that is what we are reminded of as we come to this service today, this service of worship, honoring the life that Jesus Christ gave, that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Easter Sunday embraces both of these polarities, a divine symmetry of what it means to live for Christ, and yet to reform our faith, to meet the current demands of daily life, to hold on to those things that are precious and pure, and to always be about the business of utilizing our life every day as a way of growing and developing and becoming the people we ought to be, that the world might be transformed and changed, that the, those who are hungry may be fed, those who are thirsty may have water, those who are jobless may have a, some kind of contact to make a way for themselves. And yet we do it not because we are positioned to do it. We do it because someone named Jesus did it for us. As a matter of faith, we continually reminded of the fact that this is what the biblical character is all about. God gave us life and gave it more abundantly. God gave us strength today to get out of bed and make it to church. Maybe not today, but we can have church today. And we are having church today because God made a way somehow. 
Through Jesus Christ, God redeemed us and gives us another chance. Through Jesus Christ, God gives us everything we have and reminds us over and over again that we can't have more. But even on our times of lacking, God will still take care of us. You see, the trouble in this text, however, is when those who knew Jesus the best, when those who were walking down the Emmaus Road with tears in their eyes, their tears blinded them from being able to recognize him. They did not recognize him. What a pity. At a time that we are facing in this nation and world, you know we can sometimes get caught up in the evening news. We can get caught up on the spiraling effects that we are facing in our own lives and asking the question over and over, what about me? We can spend time over and over again reaching back to when things were better and blaming for what is not in the midst of us right now. And we can begin to shed the tears of lament. And like those who followed Jesus who were headed back home after his crucifixion and they missed the resurrection, they were crying with tears and Jesus found them walking along the road. And he stopped and he had a conversation with them. And in having the conversation, they became angry when he also asked them questions that did not fully embrace the pain they were feeling. They had forgotten the promise of his return. They had forgotten the recognition of Jesus' return is not simply referencing the sweet of by and by, but something sound on the ground while we're still around. That's what Jesus brought that day. You are still in the midst of me. And Jesus reclaims this reality each time we read about the resurrection, the reality of our living and continuum of life being granted by the almighty grace that God has given to us day by day, not because we deserve it, but because God in God's own mercy and love wakes us up every single day, visits us at our bedside and gives us another day of life. Yes, we may be stuck right now trying to run away from a virus that we don't know where it came from or how it emerged and so many different theories around it. But what we know is we're here right now. We're here right now. And we're here because God has something in store for our lives. Are we planning? Are we sitting? Are we waiting? Are we rejoicing for another day and another possibility? Benjamin Mays, former president of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, captured this period in another way when he said, I have only just a minute, 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, did not choose it, I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, and I have only just a minute. but eternity is in it. What do we do with the time we have? Yes, locked up in a house, afraid, and being told by the government not to go out because of a coronavirus. Can't make it to church this morning like we'd like to. Can't see our friends in this moment. But what else can we do? What has God given us to do right where we are? And maybe God, in God's own mercy and love, just as God was willing to give God's only begotten Son for us and for the redemption of the world and the forgiveness of our sins, could that same God right now be slowing us down that we might give our full attention 
to the one who has never taken holy hands and eyes off of us. Forced upon me, didn't choose it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Have only just a minute. But eternity is in it. I believe the great reminder in this moment is calling us to be still and know that God is God. To be still and recalibrate the things that we grab for and be reminded of the thing we ought to to be paying attention to, the one we ought to be paying attention to, the one who woke us up this morning, the one who reminds us that the whole world is in divine hands. I remember as a teenager, I worked at a shoe store and earned some money while in high school. It was a cushy job. I didn't make much money, but I didn't have a whole lot of work to do once I got there. I could stand outside and wait for somebody to come in the store. Every now and then would have a chance to uh, put on a pair of shoes that I might like. Uh, but my father told me, you're not buying any shoes down there. You're not going to get money and then give money back to the same place that you are getting money from. He had some ways of thinking that uh, influenced me in some ways, so I never bought shoes from that shoe shop. But I did get enough money to purchase a eight-track tape player. I don't think anybody remembers much about that anymore, but you could push that in uh, a little switch in the car, or you could push it into a built-in piece if you had a little money to make that happen, uh, and the panel would uh, turn it on, and the music would play, and the tape would run. And uh, I purchased one for him. Uh, at least that's what I told him. And I went and got a friend of mine who knew how to rig up all of the uh, wires in the car and to hook up an eight-track uh, tape player. And I got a few gospel tapes for my daddy. He was a preacher and he liked gospel music. I got a few for him. And, uh, and I took my money from the shoe store, and I got quite a few for me. Uh, I knew that I would be driving the car every now and then. And I will never forget when I presented uh, the eight track to him, had him come out to the car, and he looked in, and I said, take a look, go and look. He saw that eight track player in there, and there was no, no expression whatsoever. I said, do you see it? Look, come on, let me get in here and show you how it works. And I went in and I pushed one of his tapes in. And um, he uh, did not show much gratitude and expression. And he didn't say much for uh, the rest of that day. And then later on that evening, he called me in uh, to his bedroom. Uh, well, my mom and dad spent most of their time when uh, and that was where I spent most of my time when I was in trouble. And I knew this was not going to be a very good conversation. I didn't get invited into that room often. And I will never forget, he uh, sat me down and he said something to me. He said, son, I want to first of all thank you for thinking of me. Uh, but I really want you to understand something. You don't give a person a gift and use the tools that they have in order to present the gift. And I said, well, you have to say a little bit more about that. He said, let me just make it plain. The car belongs to me. And for you to put an eight-track player in my car without my permission and without asking, that's a problem. Now, I appreciate it. But... Uh, I didn't ask for it. My daddy never took that eight track player out. He never stopped playing those gospel tapes. In fact, he went and got some more later on. But he taught me a lesson. 
And I take that today as I think about where we are in this period of history right now. This world doesn't belong to us. Our time does not belong to us. Our lives do not belong to us. We are lone, lone. We are borrowing from the Lord the time that we have. We can't purchase it. No, the Lord gives it to us. He wakes us up every single morning, sends us on our way, gives us a brand new start. She gives us a new way of seeing life over and over again by grace, not because we deserve it, but because God in God's own mercy gives it to us. This is the Lord's world. And Easter reminds us that we owe it all to the Lord, and therefore we must give to the Lord that which the Lord has offered to us, and that is our lives. The Lord gave us life, and we owe our lives back to God. That's the way we ought to live. That's the fullness of Easter. And that means even in times like we face right now, where it seems like there's not enough to do, where we are scratching to get back to work, where we want to get to some normality, where we are tired of all of the children making noise because they're home from school all day now, for all of the inconveniences we must face, thank God in the midst of it. We are still here to face some inconveniences. We are still here on this side of heaven to stand in the midst of God's imagination that would give us technology, that would place in us the ability to adjust to moments like this and to take time for some of us just to rest for a while. How can we be thankful, not just for a resurrection, but how can we be thankful in this period of waiting, this period of uncertainty, this period of fear in some of us? How can we take this period now and make the best of it? and allow it to make us better, better people, because we are thinking through life now. The hustle and bustle has stopped for a moment, and we can love those who are around us who we didn't have time. We can write those letters to persons that we want to communicate with. Yes, handwritten letters. Yes, we can do that now, because we have a little more time. We can make calls to those who may be alone right now because we can listen to them talk, particularly those who are lonely and want to talk a lot. We can recalibrate. We can adjust. Like those who were walking down the Emmaus Road crying, they had to adjust. They sat with him. He taught them. And they wanted him to stay with them. Because this man sounded so much like Jesus and reminded them of the Jesus they had been around. But the Jesus that they had now encountered and didn't recognize made it very plain that there was work for them to do that was before them. I sympathize with those who are facing the death of loved ones, those who are sick, those whose loved ones have died and they weren't even able to be with them because of the fear that their isolation might in some way pass on the coronavirus to their loved ones. My heart goes out in my spirit to those of us who are waiting for what might be on the way and for places like New Orleans that have seen the worst of it all in this country and New York. 
but I am also reminded that the God of life, the God of love, the God of Easter, the God of resurrection, the God who never leaves us alone, the God of power, the God of might, the God who said, let there be, and there was, and there is, still stands in the midst of us now and calls us to think about, to pause. As to what our next assignment might be. But while thinking through that, on your road to Emmaus, don't forget the calling that God has given you right now, right now, right now, right. Now, resurrection is here. Right now. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that powerful word. Now let us pray. Oh God, you gave your only son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Grant us so to die daily to sin that we may live with him in the joy of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Friends, it's time to worship the Lord in terms of giving. Even in this time of social distancing and separation from our own congregations, we are still deeply connected as the people of God. These are challenging times for many of our local churches, spiritually, emotionally and financially. We urge you to look for ways you can still be connected and still be supportive of your local congregation. Many churches are using the online giving program from the Presbyterian Foundation. Through this site, you can give to your local church and to our special offerings. In this time of crisis, we are reminded that the most vulnerable in our midst suffer first, most and longest, and that is who One Great Hour of Sharing serves. This One Great Hour of Sharing helps us to be a Matthew 25 church, responding to the needs of the most marginalized. We extend shelter to those who have no place to stay, offer compassion to those who are in pain, and we set a feast with God for those who lack access to enough food. The church's efforts begin with the most at risk in communities across the country and around the world, as well as those facing racism in response to this disease. We're also able through the one great hour of sharing to help those churches that are dealing with issues that they have been negatively impacted by through this coronavirus. So if you're looking for a way to help in the midst of the hurt we're all going through, we encourage you, support your local church and support one great hour of sharing. Let us pray. Gracious God, draw us together in these unprecedented times. Let our gifts to our local congregation and to one great hour of sharing create a home and a wholeness for people in need so that the whole human family will know your love. Amen. Thine is the glory, we 
and conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hast won. Angels in bright raiment roll the stone away, kept the folded grave close where thy body lay. Thine is the glory, risen conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hath won. Lo, Jesus meets us, risen from the tomb. Lovingly he greets us, scatters fear and gloom. Let the church with gladness hymns of triumph sing. For the Lord now liveth, death hath lost its sting. Thine is the glory, risen conquering Son. Endless is the victory, thou o death hath won. Go in peace, our friends, and remember, peace of the Lord accompanies you at all times and in all circumstances. You are beloved and a child of God. And may the good Lord bless you and keep you. And may God's face to shine upon you and lift up God's countenance and be gracious unto you, giving you peace, poise, and power for this time and always. Amen. <laughs>